Hi everyone, I'm Benjamin from ST's microcontroller division and today we'll deal with our latest series STM32WL Wireless System and Chip. As you will see, STM32WL mainly targets long-range communications. So this presentation will be divided in four main parts. First of all, we'll deal with the general architecture of the platform and its overall integration. Then we'll dive deeper in the block diagrams and even provide power data. In a third section, uh, I will describe the advanced security features of the device. And then we will conclude with a description of the protocol stacks and the whole ecosystem offer coming with STM32WL system and chip. I hope you will enjoy this presentation recorded from home. Let's do it. So for more than 10 years, we've been hitting the market with our general purpose microcontrollers portfolio, historically constituted of three main segments, your solar power MCUs, mainstream MCUs, or high performance ones. And uh, in 2018, we released our first wireless product for 2.4 GHz application, STM32WB for Bluetooth, Thread, or ZigBee, for example. And right now we are releasing our latest STM32WL series, mainly targeting long range communication. So what is STM32WL series all about? Well, uh, the first thing that you need to have in mind when talking about STM32WL is that everything is embedded on the same silicon die. That means an STM32L4 architectural basis coming with its own uh, ARM Cortex M4 core and uh, the overall peripherals, plus a second ARM Cortex uh, M0 Plus core and a uh, lower enabled sub gigahertz multi modulation radio IP. So the fact that everything is embedded on the same silicon die make STM32WL what we call a system on chip. So uh, let's review a bit the definition of a system on chip. If we have a look at uh, on what I call here the integration pyramid. Uh, well, we can figure out that up to now, all the LoRa implementation on the market have been done in a discrete way. For a PCB, it's quite simple. Basically, you have a standalone microcontroller and a standalone transceiver on the same piece of PCB. For a module, it's quite the same story, but everything, or I mean the, these two packages, are repackaged in a very tiny piece of PCB, making it a module. And for a system in package, you actually have one silicon die for the MCU and another silicon die for the uh, standalone transceiver uh, inside the same package. In the framework of WL, it's a totally different story because all the uh, different parts, meaning the MCU parts, the peripherals and the uh, transceiver part are embedded on the same silicon die. That's why STM32WL uh, is the world's first and actually the sole LoRa enabled sub gigahertz wireless system and chip on the market. So if we have a look at the eight key points uh, that makes a difference with WL, uh, these are the following ones. First of all, I've already talked about the multi-modulation capability of the device, meaning that we have LoRa capability, but also GFSK, GMSK, and BPSK. And this is very important because that enables STM32WL to be compatible with many different protocols, such as LoRa1, for example, Sigfox, or also Wireless MBUS, and actually many proprietary-based uh, uh, protocols or custom protocols. Uh, we also already talked about the massive integration that comes from the fact that it's a system on chip and such integration leads to massive cost savings for uh, our end customers. Uh, I've described the dual core architecture of the device uh, and you will see in this presentation that actually we have two different business lines, one which is uh, entirely single core M4 core based and another business line uh, which is a dual core uh, version. But the important uh, point here is that it's fully open, meaning that our customers will always, always have the possibility to implement whatever they want inside WL in terms of firmware and protocol stack. Uh, I mentioned that it's based on the architectural basis on an L4 MCU, so that means that this platform is uh, ultra low power. 
and it, it's actually ready for the Internet of Things because it comes with uh, usual standard safety and security features, I would say, but also with advanced security features that are enabled through the uh, dual core architecture and that I will describe also in this presentation, obviously. We have a large offer of uh, packages from QFN up to BGA. And you will see as well that uh, we have many different part numbers depending on the number of, uh, of modulation that you want to activate, for example, or uh, depending on the uh, flash size that you want to get. Uh, and then obviously when we hit the market with the new uh, silicon chip, we uh, always provide a full ecosystem that comes with it. And this will be described in this presentation too. Finally, we have our usual 10-year longevity commitment, meaning that whenever we hit the market with a pound number, we commit in being able to sell the same pound number for at least 10 years. And usually such uh, commitment is actually renewed uh, every year. So it usually lasts much more than 10 years. So now that I've provided you with an overview of the architecture of the device and the main key points, let's dive deeper in the use cases and the block diagrams of the two product lines. Let's begin with the uh, four modulation available in the device. As mentioned previously, there are LoRa, GFSK, GMSK and BPSK. So with LoRa modulation, obviously you can target LoRa1 use cases, LoRa1 being the protocol being standardized by the LoRa Alliance. But also with WL, if you want to, you can uh, address LoRa-based proprietary protocol, okay? Meaning proprietary protocols based on LoRa modulation. Also uh, with the GFSK, GMSK and BPSK, you can, you can target other protocols such as Sigfox, for example, I think Sigfox use BPSK for uplink and GFSK for uh, downlink, or also wireless MBUS. And actually, uh, all these modulation, modulations can be used for uh, whatever custom or prop proprietary protocol as well. If we have a look now at the block diagram of the first product line of STM32WL series, which is STM32WL-E. Well, first, the first thing to say is that in that case, uh, we have only one Cortex M4 core inside uh, with its own DSP instruction and uh, the frequency can go up to 48 megahertz. Uh, of course, I will not detail all the, the blocks here, but rather highlight some of the most important ones. For example, in the red here AP, I've already expressed many times that we have four modulations available. We have a linear frequency range from 150 up to 960 megahertz. So that means that you can target whatever geographic area in the world that uh, your, your use case need or your geographic market needs. And we have as well two different output power, one which can go up to 15 dBm and another one which can go up to 22 dBm. The main difference in between these two power outputs are, uh, is the, the power efficiency. Indeed, uh, both uh, power outputs are programmable with 32 steps. So with 22 dBm output power, for example, you can use it at 15 dBm, but in such framework, if you uh, want to target an application needing only 15 dBm max, then it's in that case, it's much better to use the 15 dBm power output because it's more power efficient. So for example, for the American power market, you will use a 22 dBm output power, whereas for the European uh, market, you will use the 15 dBm output power. Then also, it's uh, good to mention that uh, with only one external 32 MHz crystal, you can actually synchronize both the uh, radio part of the device and the MCU part of the device. Also, we have uh, usual uh, standard security features uh, in the same way as what is available in our wall general purpose microcontroller portfolio, meaning AES, true random number generator, uh, PC RAP standing here for our program code readout protection or temper detection, for example. And uh, as well, obviously, uh, you have many of the peripherals that you're already uh, very already used to it if you are already an STM32 users, user. 
So now if we have a look at the second product line being based on the STM32WL series, this is STM32WL5 series. And in that case, the first thing that you can observe is that here we actually have two core, one Cortex M4 core and a Cortex M0 plus. So Cortex M0 plus must be approached or seen as the core managing the advanced security of the device. Indeed, on such product line, there are advanced security features which are available only on this product line and which are not available on the single core architecture version, the one that I've previously shown. Uh, in terms of advanced security features then, namely we have, for example, the ability to isolate uh, secure areas being based respectively on Cortex M4 core and Cortex M0 plus. We have what is called here as well key management services, uh, which enables our user to use a dedicated memory area in order to manage secure objects um, in a very uh, safe and secure way. Uh, for example, you could store uh, applicative keys, uh, you could derivate uh, new keys or sign and verify secure objects, for example. We have also a secure firmware install or a secure firmware update capability on the dual core version, a secure boot as well, a debug control, the ability to control your debug on Cortex M4 core or Cortex M0 plus. You can lock your boot uh, in between uh, Cortex M4 or Cortex M0 plus. And uh, also we have up to six uh, security domains of course, I will, uh, I will come back to this later on when I will uh, describe in more details the uh, advanced security features of the dual core product line. So if we have a look now at the portfolio of the device, we have two packages, one QFN 48 pins, uh, seven by seven millimeter, and a BGS 73 pin, five by five millimeters. In the framework of QFN48 usage, then in that case, you can uh, enable up to 29 GPIOs. Uh, but uh, in such framework, your uh, bill of material cost will be optimized because with QFN, you will be able to uh, enable two layer PCBs. Whereas with BGA, you, can, uh, you, you have much more flexibility because you can update or uh, enable, sorry, up to 43 GPIOs and the package footprint is actually more tiny. So you can observe uh, um, on this diagram the two product lines that I mentioned previously. In light blue, you have the dual core version of the device and in dark blue, you have the single core version of the device. The single core version of the device is available with three different sizes of flash for each package. And any PAN number that can be observed on such uh, block diagram is available with all the modulation uh, activated. Or you can also uh, decide to acquire some PAN numbers where all the modulation are available except LoRa modulation, depending on your um, bill of material cost targets. The STM32WL is definitely suitable to address a wide range of uh, key vertical markets. You can actually see here a list of vertical markets as defined by the LoRa Alliance. So I talked, for example, about the multi-protocol capability for the uh, utilities market and the linear frequency range 150 up to 960 megahertz, uh, making this device uh, suitable for any geographic market. For smart cities and buildings, well, the, uh, sense, the, the, the best sensitivity that can be achieved in, uh, in the LoRa framework uh, with WL has been measured down to 148 dBm, which is extremely good, an excellent sensitivity for uh, smart cities. Uh, for logistics, we have unique IDs uh, inside this device, so 164 uh, bit uh, unique IDs and another one, uh, 96 bit unique IDs, very useful for uh, traceability, for example. Uh, for industrial uh, IoT, we have PAN numbers which are uh, characterized up to 105 degrees Celsius. 
uh, for smart agriculture, uh, we uh, guarantee uh, that WL will be suitable for link budget higher than 160 dB, for example. So very long range can, uh, can be achieved. And uh, for smart home, uh, actually, we, uh, we have um, features definitely improving the battery life of the, of the device. Uh, you could see, for example, on the black diagram previously that there's actually an embedded DC-DC inside the, inside the device. So meaning that depending on your uh, power consumption targets, uh, you can decide to choose either uh, the internal LDO or the embedded DC-DC. And also uh, mixed signal uh, features with uh, ADC and uh, DAC, very useful for uh, smart home use cases. So obviously with uh, STM32WL, uh, we have a massive integration and the massive integration leads to cost savings for end users and for customers. It also simplifies and speed up the, the time to market. And uh, actually the communication between the radio IP and the MCU is actually much less exposed, I would say, than in a standalone implementation being based on a standalone MCU plus a standalone transceiver. Obviously, the total size of the, the final PCB will be smaller as well. So all of this represents the main uh, advantages in terms of integration uh, related to STM32WL series. So let's talk now about the flexible power scheme of the device. The first thing to uh, observe on such table is the left column, where you can see a non-exhaustive list of the power modes. It's important to keep in mind that the set of peripherals and wake-up sources which are available depends on the power mode that you are currently using. For example, all the peripherals and wake-up sources will be available if you use a mode in between uh, stop one up to run mode, whereas in stop two mode, for example, you will keep only a subset of peripherals which remains rich enough to serve your application needs. Now, in terms of RAM retention, basically it's possible to uh, keep uh, some uh, RAM context or to have a RAM retention in all the modes except shutdown. And this is actually extremely important in order to keep your applicative context, for example. And the last column, the RF part, uh, is here to uh, show that the RF part of the device, meaning the radio part, will always be available in all the modes except shutdown. So that means that even if the MCU part of the device is in standby mode, the radio part of the device will still be able to transmit or receive protocol frame on the network of your choice. So let me provide now some more information or I would say figures about power consumption. If uh, we assume that you are using your STM32WL in a full run mode, uh, the, the first option that you can play with uh, in order to optimize your power efficiency or your power consumption is to use either the embedded LDO or the embedded DCDC that we saw previously on the block diagram. Then uh, you can uh, choose in between two voltage ranges, ranges range one or range two, because there is actually uh, voltage scaling inside the device. You can also decide to stop your CPU clock and enter what is called sleep mode. So in run range one, range two and sleep mode, you play basically with the performances of your device and you play also with the uh, power efficiency and the dynamic um, power consumption. If now you want to optimize your static power consumption, you can enter stop one mode, for example. In stop one mode, you will actually stop the clock of the core supply of the device. If that's not enough in terms of optimization of static power consumption, uh, you can decide to power off some sub part of the core supply. And in that case, you will enter stop two, where, for example, you are able to achieve uh, around one microamp as static power consumption. In standby mode and shutdown mode, uh, you, you actually power off the whole core supply. The only difference in between these two modes is that in standby mode, you are still able to have 
uh, RAM retention and thus applicative context if you need. And then the final mode that is mentioned here is, uh, is mentioned as VBAT and uh, it's actually how we call the backup domain where the backup domain is just um, a subpart of the circuit that can be, for example, uh, powered with an external battery and in uh, such very tiny part of the device you will keep only the RTC, real-time clock, um, the anti-temper detection and finally 20 32 byte registers for example to keep very uh, minor uh, applicative context or uh, information for example so if we want to compare now the differences in between all the stop modes uh, you can see that the wake up times in uh, stop 0 stop 1 stop 2 is actually uh, very good. In step 0, for example, we are able to achieve 2.2 .2 microseconds and it, in step 1 mode, while lowering by a factor of approximately 100 the power consumption down to 4.55 microamps, we are still able to wake up the device in only 5 microseconds. Okay? If that's not enough, uh, you can even uh, lower down the power consumption down to one microamp with a step two mode uh, while still being able to wake it up in 5.5 .5 microsecond. Here it's uh, very important to highlight that there is no impact on the wake up time from the embedded DCDC. Usually it takes time to wake up a DCDC, but there's a very cool architecture in STM32WL which make it able to wake up automatically in 5.5 uh, .5 microseconds, for example, in LDO mode. And whenever the DCDC will be ready, then the device will automatically switch from LDO usage to DC, DC usage if that's what you want to do. So uh, it's a very good way to be as power efficient uh, as possible in a DCDC usage framework. Also, uh, in step 2 mode, you can see here that there is only a subset of peripherals which uh, remains available, but it's still rich enough to uh, serve whatever uh, applica applicative needs that you might have. Now, in terms of RF performances, I want to really emphasize the fact that the RF performances will be as good as what you uh, can get currently on the market for standalone uh, transceivers. Uh, in terms of TX, RX, in terms of sensitivity as well for both LoRa and uh, GFSK, for example. And also let me remind that the stm 32 wl series is actually worldwide compatible. Indeed, there is a linear frequency range from 150 MHz up to 960 MHz, making it uh, compatible with whatever geographic uh, market in the world. And also there is a dual output power uh, that we're about to describe right now. Indeed, uh, you can select either a low power power output up to 15 dBm or a high power power output up to 22 dBm. Both of these power outputs are actually programmable with 32 steps each. And the low power uh, power output is actually much more optimized in terms of power consumption. So if you target, for example, the European market, you will rather use the 15 dBm power output. For the American market or a Chinese market, for example, respectively at 22 dBm or 17 dBm, then in that case, it will be necessary to use the high power uh, output power. Also, you can decide to use the uh, internal uh, LDO or the internal DCDC. If you want to, uh, to optimize your power consumption and use the internal DCDC, then you will just basically need an external self on your PCB. Okay, but uh, if you, however, you uh, want to use only the internal uh, LDO, then no external self will be needed and then your bill of material cost will be slightly more optimized. Also, a very uh, good piece of work from our application team is the fact that around STM32WL on your bill of material, 
there is no need to use a TCXO standing for temperature compensated crystal oscillator in order to uh, to implement a LoRaWAN or Sigfox application. Indeed, just a simple crystal oscillator will be uh, okay. I mean, a 32 uh, megahertz a simple crystal oscillator will be okay to guarantee the correct functioning of your lower one uh, application or Sigfox application, which here again lowers your uh, bill of material cost. So very nice achievement here from our application teams. So now let's deal with advanced security features available in STM32WL series and also with stacks that will be available on ST.com. So we can have a look at the full list of uh, safety features and security features that are available in uh, STM32WL series. Uh, in dark blue, you can see the features that are available in both the single core version of the device and the dual core version. Whereas in uh, light blue, uh, these are the features that are available only in the dual core versions. So let's focus on the light blue ones for now. Uh, first of all, we have secure hardware isolation in between the Cortex M4 core and the Cortex M0 Plus, leading to six security domains that I will describe later on. Then we have what is called secure key management services. Also, on the next slide, I will describe this a bit more in details. We have also basically secure boot code protection, secure firmware install and update, boot selection, debug control, and also crypto libraries. So let's uh, detail this a bit in the next slides. First of all, regarding the uh, secure key management services, basically uh, it's a dedicated memory area that user can uh, use in order to store keys or objects, for example, but actually it's not only storage. It can be used for object or secure object management, meaning that users can create, update, or delete, delete secure objects, for example. Uh, SKMS benefits from AES encryption and decryption. It can also digest functions, sign or verify uh, in an RSA framework. And also, obviously, uh, there is key generation possibilities and key derivations as well. Then on the right side, we have secure firmware install or update. Both of them are uh, useful when uh, manufacturing is needed from an untrusted manufacturer, manufacturer for example, a subcontractor. Uh, actually, in the system flash uh, memory of the STM32WL, uh, there is the uh, embedded secure firmware install and what we call the RSS standing for root security services. So this such secure firmware is programmed by ST Microelectronics inside the WL during production. And uh, it's allowed the programming of the flash memory uh, with the same interface uh, than the one used by the embedded bootloader. So the embedded SFI and root security services can be used to load content in secure and non-secure memory areas. Also, we have what is called secure boot to ensure that our users can boot from the right memory locations. Um, and also to ensure that uh, each application firmware can be authenticated before being executed. Finally, we provide also a crypto library uh, benefiting from embedded hardware uh, crypto accelerators inside the uh, STM32WL. Um, and uh, obviously, this library also provides many algorithms or cryptographic algorithms for uh, further cryptographic needs. So basically, we can say that uh, inside STM32WL, security is present in every corner. Because regarding the uh, memory, for example, we've already mentioned the fact that the system flash memory embeds a secure firmware install uh, firmware or root security services. Also, we have up to six security domains uh, that will be described a bit more later on. Uh, through what we call memory privilege watermarking uh, controlled by secure areas. 
Um, and finally, we also have uh, execution prevention uh, regarding the SRAM. Regarding the peripherals, actually, some of them can be secured. That's the case for AES, PKS standing for Public Key Accelerator, True Random Number Generator. SPI3 here stands for the SPI being used in between the uh, uh, cortex core and the radio part of the device. So that means that the communication in between the radio of the device and the MCU part of the device can be encrypted. Also, the DMA direct memory access channels can be secured as well. And usually security uh, is enabled by option bytes. Also, in terms of debug, we ensure that uh, the debug, for example, the debug of the Cortex M0 Plus can be disabled by user option, depending on the security needs of our customers. Also, with the secure boot and the security mechanisms that I've just described, we can implement what is called a chain of trust. Indeed, the boot can be secured, locked and protected against debug so that the next application step can be authenticated and certified. Then the subsequent execution steps can be trusted. And this is what we call a chain of trust. Let's have a look now on an example of secure implementation. First of all, here we can clearly see a secure hardware isolation in between the non-secure M4 core and the secure Cortex M0 Plus. And then we can observe, observe what is called privileged areas and unprivileged areas, thanks to a mechanism called privileges watermarking. So uh, with unprivileged non-secure, privileged non-secure areas and unprivileged secure areas, and finally privileged secure areas, we have four security domains. Then we have HDPA, uh, standing for High Protected Area in SBSFU, Secure Boot, Secure Firmware Update, which could be here considered as a fifth security domain. And finally, you remember that in the system flash of the device, we have the root security services and the secure firmware install firmware. Also here, uh, five peripherals have been secured, namely the AES, the True Random Number Generator, the SPI, meaning that the communication in between the secure Cortex M0 Plus and the radio IP here is secured, the channels of the DMA, and the PK here for public key accelerators. So the purpose of this slide is to provide an overview of what is feasible in terms of security settings regarding the security domain, but also in terms of privileges and unprivileged settings. Okay, so for example, if we focus on this uh, setting of the uh, secure M0 Plus, so here the M0 Plus is secure and privileged. And we can see that M0 Plus in such framework can access to all the memory regions that are uh, controlled either by the M0 Plus or the uh, Cortex M4, except the high protection uh, secure area, which is the highest security domain. Also, now if we have a look at the, for example, Cortex M4 non-secure privileged uh, settings here, we can see that uh, in that way, the Cortex M4 can access only to the uh, flash and RAM memory areas managed by the Cortex M4, which is a big difference between because in the first case, the Cortex M0 Plus could access to both the regions managed by the Cortex M0 Plus and the Cortex M4, whereas the Cortex M4 here can access only to the uh, memory regions managed by the Cortex M4. So, of course, you have many in-between configurations depending on uh, your privilege settings and depending on your security domain. And what is true for the settings of the Cortex cores is also true for the uh, configuration of the DMA channels. Here is another example of dual core firmware isolation. So here the goal was to implement the wireless stack, which could be LoRaWAN or Sigfox, for example, on the secure Cortex M0 Plus core of the STM32WL and to implement the applicative layer on the Cortex M4 core. By doing so, 
customers can actually uh, lock their wireless stack and certify it on the Cortex M0 Plus core, which is secured, so that even if they push their devices on field and even if they need to update their uh, applicative layers, uh, for example, through over the air update, uh, then they will be able to do so without paying for recertification cost because there is a total hardware isolation in between the wireless stack on the secure Cortex M0 Plus, locked and secure, and the applicative layers being updated on the non secure. Cortex M4 core. So it's a very interesting feature here for customers who do not want to pay for recertification costs each time they want to perform update of applicative layers. Just a very brief slide here to express that uh, STM32WL customers will always keep full flexibility in their implementation, meaning that the STM32WL platform is fully open the radio inside it is fully open and uh, it's up to customers to decide whatever firmware they want to implement inside it and also to decide in between a standard implementation in terms of security or a full feature security implementation. So you have now understood that the STM32WL is fully IoT protection ready and let's review now a radio stack or application firmware update process. So uh, first of all, you need to observe uh, the uh, what is called here the active slot containing the current version of the firmware, version 1.0, and that's this uh, version that we want to uh, substitute with version 2.0 through such firmware updates. So let's do it. First of all, we will uh, receive a new firmware package over the air, okay. Then uh, this uh, update will be launched uh, by the secure Cortex M0 Plus. Then the authentication uh, process will be done. And if the signature matches uh, the target signature, then the uh, process will be continued. In case not obvious, it will be aborted and the device will be reset. Um, and finally, and only when the uh, authentication has been done, we can now uh, update uh, the firmware from the download slot to the active slot. The firmware update process is now over. And we are very glad to mention that in the framework of KubeWL uh, package provided uh, free of charge on sc.com, we provide such mechanism through Secure Boot Secure Firmware Update and also through a source code of LoRaWAN firmware update over the air. So it's very important for us to ensure that STM32WL is ready in front of many kinds of attacks, uh, whether they are software-based or non-invasive ones. And for many forms of uh, hacking attacks or uh, attacks, we have actually countermeasures that are based on many security and safety features that I've been described in the security section of this presentation. So to sum up, all these, uh, these security mechanisms and security features can be translated into customer benefits, which are a very flexible security implementation. We saw it with the dual core implementation, for example, but also with the uh, single core implementation. Uh, we have IP protection, non-clonable device, a trustability of the device and anti-hacking, and finally, a very trustable fleet maintenance. So it's now time to talk about the different stacks that are available on ST.com. First of all, we have a lower one stack available free of charge in our firmware package called stm 32 cubewl Well, this lower one stack has been fully certified for all lower one uh, regions, first of all, and the code is actually provided in source code format. So that means that you can uh, get this code, reuse it, tweak it if you need to, no problem at all. Here again, obviously, up to you to implement your Laurent stack in the single core version of STM32WL series or in the dual core version. We have also the Sigfox stack 
available uh, on st.com as well, free of charge. And here again, uh, the Sigfox stack has been fully certified for all Sigfox radio configuration, uh, corresponding to geographic areas, meaning from RC1 up to RC7. But we have also what is called the Monarch certification. So in case you don't know what Monarch is, Basically, it enables uh, STM32WL-based devices to understand after wake-up the geographic area where they are currently based and adapt their frequency and uh, power output to local regulations. So it's a very good achievement here to have the full geographic certification and the Monarch certification for STM32WL. Here again, the stack is provided in, uh, op in an open way, except the Sigfox core library, which by definition cannot be open, of course, but all the surrounding code is provided in an open way. We also have a partnership with stack provider Stackforce, who ported a wireless MBUS stack on STM32WL series. So in case you have any wireless MBUS need, feel free to contact Stackforce. And actually, with uh, their implementation, you can actually be compatible with mod S, T, C, and N, depending on the frequency that you need and depending on the wireless and bus mod that you actually need in your application. And in uh, Stackforce implementation, it's actually even cooler than just a wireless and bus implementation because you can actually replace the wireless and bus Mac and Phi by the Lower one Mac. In such framework, you can get a wireless MBUS implementation over Lower one. By the way, before moving to the whole ecosystem presentation, let me remind that in our own Lower one stack, available free of charge on ST.com in our STM32CubeWL firmware package, there is the example of a firmware update over the air implementation. So such code, which is actually provided in source code format, is suitable for massive STM32WL fleet updates. It's actually network server agnostic and has been demonstrated and validated on many different kinds of network servers and is class B and class C compatible. So feel free to enjoy this also in our uh, firmware package STM32CubeWL available on ST.com. Let's now address the STM32WL series whole ecosystem. So maybe the first thing to mention before describing the ecosystem is that the STM32WL series was released on the market in a mass market way in December 2020. So everything that is currently being described in this presentation is already available on the market, meaning that you can already find uh, some nuclear boards already available on various distributors' websites, for example, but also the chips themselves, I mean the STM32WL chips, are available uh, through different PAN numbers being currently sold by different distributors. So let's have a look at what uh, the STM32WL ecosystem deals with. First of all, we can divide it in hardware ecosystem where we provide what we call a nuclear board for flexible prototyping. Then, as always, and in the same way as what we do with all our uh, other uh, general purpose microcontroller portfolio or other wireless microcontrollers, we provide a set of tools uh, that can be used concurrently with uh, STM32WL prototyping. For example, STM32 CubeMX, Cube Monitor, Cube Programmer, different IDEs. And last but not least, what we call STM32CubeWL, which is actually a firmware package containing, for example, the hardware abstraction layer, but also the utilities or the middleware, meaning the different stacks. So in STM32CubeWL uh, firmware package, you will find the lower one stack, free of charge, the Sigfox stack, free of charge as well. And uh, basically that's it. For wireless MBUS, as mentioned previously, uh, you need to contact Stackforce in such framework. So let's assume you want to use an STM32WL nuclear board for prototyping. Well, in such framework, you will be able to use the different tools provided in the ecosystem coming with the STM32WL series. For example, STM32 CubeMX, where you will be able to configure the pinout of your device 
Then also you can work on the clock tree synthesis, for example, and Cubemix will actually automatically generate some code for you to make your uh, software development life much easier. With STM32 Cube Programmer, you will be able to flash your firmware in a very easy way in your device. And with STM32 Cube Monitor, you will actually be able to perform uh, RF advanced testing. I will detail this a bit more later on. So what is the STM32 WL Nuclear Board all about? Well, the first thing to mention is that there are actually two part numbers, Nucleo-WL55-JC1 for high bond development and JC2 for low bond development. Meaning that, for example, with the high bond version of the Nucleo board, you can target development in Europe, 868, America, for example, 915, or Asia, 900. And 23. Whereas with the Loban version of the nuclear board, you can mainly target Chinese market, 470 up to 510 megahertz actually. But you can also use it uh, with the 433 megahertz development, depending on the local regulations. So what is that all about in terms of hardware? Well, first of all, we can observe uh, an SMA connector when you can plug in the antenna of your choice. Then there are actually Arduino connectors so that you can connect shield boards or daughter boards on top of it coming from ST or from other communities. Then there is also obviously the STM32WL usually under a metallic shield. Then uh, through the integrated ST-Link uh, you can actually flash uh, your device in a mass storage way so very handy for your development. And then you have two push buttons and two LEDs to make your development much smoother. And finally, you can uh, decide to power your board through USB or uh, an external source. So I've already mentioned when talking about LoRaWAN stack or Sigfox stack that both of these stacks have been fully certified. And actually, the certification vehicle for such purpose was actually the nuclear board. So you can be very confident in this board's ability to be used for whatever LoRaWAN development purpose or Sigfox development purpose. This board can actually be enabled on whatever LoRaWAN real network. And that's also true if you want to enable it on Sigfox network. To do so on the real Sigfox network, you just need to follow the link that I provide here, my.st.com slash sfxp. Also, we passed the full uh, commercial certification, meaning CE, FCC, IC, and type. So you can be uh, really confident that this nuclear board is a rock solid platform for your prototyping or development related to uh, sub gigahertz use cases. STM32 Cube Monitor is also a great tool in order to perform multi-modulation command, for example, or perform different kind of sub gigahertz tests protocol tests such as LoRaWAN tests, Sigfox tests, etc. And actually it can be used with the official nuclear boards, but also with your own custom PCB uh, through USB or UART connection, for example. So this is a very flexible tool and useful tool to perform advanced testing of your sub gigahertz use cases. So you have now understood the main software development path where you can use, for example, STM32 CubeMX to start, where you will be able to uh, configure your pinout, for example, your clock tree synthesis, and then you will generate code automatically. Uh, you can use it concurrently with the IDE of your choice, such as IAR or ARMCAL, but also with our free of charge STM32 Cube IDE software. And then you can perform RF advanced testing with STM32 Cube Monitor to finally be able to flash your uh, firmware in, uh, for example, a nuclear board or also in your custom PCB if that's what you want to do. So another way to sum this up is this one. Basically, we provide tools for configuration, CubeMX, CubeIDE, development, STM32, CubeIDE, programming with a Cube Programmer and uh, CubeIDE again, and uh, monitoring through CubeMonitor, the stacks, as you have understood, 
uh, the run stack, Sigfox stack are enabled and provided in STM32 kubewl. And uh, in the future, we will also provide STM32 cube expansion for additional expansions and function packs. So now that I've provided you with a full description of the chip itself and the whole ecosystem that comes with it, we can have a final look at all the savings that will be triggered by the wall STM32WL series offer. First of all, in terms of silicon, well, uh, using an STM32WL system and chip will mean a deep integration factor. So uh, that's actually the uh, maximum integration that is feasible in order to have uh, sub gigahertz LoRa enable applications. So in such framework, instead of using two chips, one for the microcontroller and another one for the transceiver, you will be able to use only an STM32WL and thus you will save money for this. You will also be able to use less external component because we saw that, for example, with a single 32 MHz crystal, you can actually synchronize both the MCU part of the device, but also the radio, the embedded radio inside it. So no more two 32 MHz crystal on your PCB, only one is enough. Then uh, I also demonstrated that it's possible to use a simple 32 MHz uh, crystal instead of a temperature compensated crystal oscillator. So that means you will save money with this as well. And finally, with the QFN package, you can uh, enable two layers PCBs. Then in terms of ecosystem, well, it's pretty simple because first of all, the two stacks that are provided on ST.com, meaning a lower one stack in a source code format and Sigfox stack, uh, almost fully open as well, are provided uh, free of charge both. And all the tools that come uh, with it are also provided free of charge, either for configuration with Kubenix, with monitoring with KubeMonitor, programming with KubeProgrammer, or software development with Cube IDE. Everything is free of charge. Now, one brief word about our STM32 rolling longevity commitment. Well, basically, uh, with our 10-year longevity commitment, we commit in being able to provide the same pound number for at least 10 years. And such commitment is actually renewed every year. So it usually lasts much more than 10 years, as you can see, for example, in this diagram with F1, which has been committed for uh, more than 22 years now. And it will be the case for WL as well, at least 10 years of commitment renewed every year. So let's finally review everything that we've learned through this presentation. First of all, STM32WL series is a multi-modulation system and chip, meaning LoRa, GFSK, GMSK, and BPSK will enable you to implement whatever protocol that you want, such as LoRa1, Sigfox, wireless MBUS, for example, or actually many other ones, whether there are proprietary ones, custom ones, or standardized ones. The uh, STM32WL series is a wireless system and chip with a maximum integration factor, which will lead you to massive cost savings. The platform is, itself is a dual core architecture with two different product lines, one which is single core, the other one being dual core. And the uh, device is actually fully open, so it will be always up to device makers to decide whatever they want to implement inside it. The device itself is a real ultra low power platform and is fully ready for the IoT thanks to different safety features, security features, and actually also advanced security features that we reviewed together. Then we saw that there are currently a QFN48 package and a BGS73 package with many different kind of uh, pod numbers, depending on the modulation that you want to activate, for example, and depending on the flash size that you need. Then we review the whole ecosystem offer that comes with it. So Cube Programmer, for example, Cube Monitor, Cube MX, or a Cube WL firmware package. All of these are great tools that will help you through your different developments. And finally, we just reviewed uh, the 10-year longevity commitment for STM32WL series.
So it's going to be time for me to tell you goodbye very soon. But before doing so, I would like to highlight some of the links provided here. So first of all, I would like to highlight obviously st.com slash stm32wl where you will find many information about STM32WL series, such as the data sheets of the product, the reference manuals of the two product lines, single core and dual core, and also many application notes that will really help you through your development. So I really suggest that you have a look at the uh, official webpage of the STM32WL series. Then also I can talk briefly about the community, uh, where we have a very big STM32 users community. So feel free to ask as many questions as you want here about STM32WL or about any other STM32 devices. And also, of course, feel free to explore all the other links provided here. So thank you very much for attending this full presentation about STM32WL series. Goodbye.